My name is Mark Beebe, and I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and I struggle with codependency, among other things. And I now um, have a, I now have a complaint. And here it is. Like, look at. I know I'm fully aware that we have we have changed some of the biblical comparisons of the steps. And I know that some of you, I believe that some of you are being little rebels in this place and deliberately trying to jack up the way we're reading those comparisons. And you're going to like, we got to get with that we can do a better job than the paltry job we just did. Amen. And so like, we got to learn to try to somehow be in sync. And like, what I guess we're going to have to do is stop and tell the worship host, let's pray that the Holy Spirit gets on top of all of us and gives us the right temperament of those, those comparisons, right? So that we say them at the same time. Matt was doing a terrific job leading them at the right pace and everything else. And Matt, you had rebels out here that couldn't stay with it. Father, forgive them because they do know what they do. Amen? <laughs> How about that? I made that up, right? That all on my own. I'm like, I'm pretty proud. Let's... Uh, Man, here's a couple of announcements. As you know, we're not able to have, for one, for tonight only, we're not able to have pre-covery. We're just taking some appropriate precautions, and we are also, for that same reason, we are not able to do the men's codependency group. So if you generally go to the men's codependency group, we're going to recommend that you go to the, um, to the lost group that Carol and David lead following worship tonight. Make sense? And I want you to know that we are going to be having um, worship and the full complement of groups next Thursday. And then on Christmas Eve, we're going to be having a combined recovery open share group at noon here in this building. I'll be leading that. And then on New Year's Eve, we're going to be having a women's and a men's open share group at 630 for that night. And then we will resume our full complement of worship in all of our groups um, the first week of January. So all that will be is probably now and will be posted at recoveryofcokesbury.com if you need more information about that. Let's pray together. Sweet Jesus, thank you so much for the time that you have with us here and for the way that you love us and the way that you speak to us and the way that you encourage us and the way that you hold us, and the way that you walk with us. Just use this time to bring all that to a fullness. In your sweet name we pray, amen. So step nine continues what we started off with in step eight. Step eight, we talked about, are we willing, are we willing to pursue freedom by working on reconciling and being honest about relationships that we have struggled with in our lives. And again, um, the second half of sort of, a, of this um, sort of duet is step nine. I called it facing myself. And it goes like this. We made direct demands to such people whenever possible. We gotta talk about that. Except when to do so would injure them or others, except when to do so would injure them or others. And the biblical comparison that you just heard is, if you're offering your gift at the altar, remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. And so a lot to talk about, but it's definitely a relationship step. It's definitely about closure, and it's definitely true, as we've talked about before, that there is a desire on the part of, of, of us that start to work, you know, work on a recovery life, that we want to make all of that relationship, all those relationship issues, get them all right right now, because we are becoming aware of how we answer this question that we were not aware of before. And the awareness piece is, what is my part in this? It's like there's a part of the big book that says, that we've talked about, that says, you know, if there's a disturbance in my life, I need to first start out by going, 
what does that have to do with me? How, 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 what, what part in this disturbance, if there is one, am I playing? Am I playing a part in what is happening right now? Whether it's relationships, me, whatever. Am I playing a part? I, there's a, the new thing that I think hardly anybody, anybody really has going on until you get some recovery is the whole concept of self-examination, right? The concept of self-awareness. If you did a whole lot of work with deeper spirituality and you did a whole lot of, of, of study with that, you would get to that as a spiritual principle, self-examination. And that's what, that's what uh, goes with these steps of, of asking the question of what is, what is the actual truth, not what is the avoidance, but what is the truth of what is happening in this relationship that I have with this person. And so tonight, we're asking the question, have I hurt other people in my life? And if so, how have I hurt them? And now how can I, how can I make it right? How can I create a reconciling step with that person or those persons in my life. And like I was saying, one of the things that's a little tough about this step is we wanna be able to go from our awareness of ourselves, which is new for us in recovery, all the way to this step kind of right away. Like we wanna figure out how to right the wrong right away. We wanna figure out how to correct all the relationships right away, whether they're friendships, whether they're family members, lots of times they're family members, or whether they're marriages or whatever. We wanna get after it right now. And healthy recovery, healthy working of the steps says, there's a reason why you work step one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, right, before you get to eight and nine. There's now, now you know, you might, you might be able to f go along with the first three steps by yourself. And by the third step, you're kind of wondering like, I wonder why, um, I wonder why all these people keep talking to me about needing a sponsor. How come everybody's talking to me about needing a sponsor? How come everybody's talking to me about, you know, even or the idea of doing therapy? How come there's gotta be all this, why is, why is all this feedback necessary? Well, the reason is when it comes to these, you go to these later, you start with step four, doing that by yourself, the truth of it is, you're gonna miss stuff because you're still not gonna be secure enough by yourself to ask the harder questions. That's why you have someone that's a guide. That's why you have someone that has been in those steps, someone that knows, the, the, for one thing, the pain of some of this, and two, has the maturity recovery-wise, right, to be able to walk you through it and to be able to, like, I think the, the, the really effective purpose of a sponsor is kind of like when, um, when I, was, when I was, at least in theory, it never really worked out too good. I mean, I, I, I like, as a, as, a, as a hitter, you know, I hit, I hit like in the 300s left-handed, and I never, I never ever could hit above 250 right-handed. I just couldn't, I couldn't figure out the concept very well. I, just, I was definitely a, much more of a pure left-handed hitter. I did it, but man, I didn't like it. But the way I learned to hit right-handed as, as best I could is I had a, there was a device that they would roll up to the batter's box. And this device was a, like a padded, it was like a padded stop. And so what would happen is, when you would try to bail out on a pitch, you would hit that, you would hit that backstop, right? And your back would go against it and it would keep you there. And I really, I really do believe that the purpose of, the purpose of, one of the purposes of sponsorship is to be that backstop for us, right? It's really, you know, it's actually, it's actually Jesus through your sponsor gently putting his hand on your back saying, we're not gonna go backwards anymore, we're gonna go forwards. And I know this is difficult 
and I know you're uncomfortable, in my case, switch hitting, and I know you don't like it, and I know you don't think that's your strong suit, and I know you're gonna say you'd rather do what's more familiar for you. You'd rather deal with your defense mechanisms, and you'd rather deal with the alternative other than the truth of what really has happened, and you'd rather put the responsibility someplace else other than ask the question of, what is my role in this? Do I have one? But the gentle, positive pressure of Jesus using your sponsor to put his hand on your back so you don't bail out is a gift, amen? And it doesn't seem, you know, like it doesn't, I don't think we get that fully until we start doing the harder work, the work of examining my life in the fourth step, the work of sharing my life in the fifth step, the work of looking at, looking at what God needs to remove from my life in the sixth and seventh step, what is broken in me, then the eighth step now making it right with other people. Like those all require support from outside of me by necessity. And that's why we talk early on about that need for the, you know, for the sponsor relationship. This is a, this is a closure step. This is the beginning of the closure step of, I'm now gonna close, I'm not gonna be work on closing the life that I was living, and now I'm gonna be learning to live the free life in Jesus, amen? And I have the confidence in Jesus and who I am in Jesus to be able to take that walk back with him to a difficult place in my life, knowing that I'm not alone, and knowing that I am, you know, I am capable with him of, of telling the hard truth and I'm gonna be willing to stand there and do it. One of the most difficult things about this ninth step of making it right is where is the balance between what this step talks about is except when to do so would injure them or others in the process of laying it down? What is, where is the balance between that necessity and the necessity of not keeping secrets. Like, here's a great quote that I found. It says, this step does carry a condition. The condition is, except when to do so would injure them or others. The benefit of making amends to the recovering person does not outweigh the need to do any more harm. The benefit of making amends to a recovering person does not outweigh the need to do any more harm. If the act of making amends will open old wounds for that person or create new wounds, new harm, then making direct, direct amends, we'll talk about that in a minute, making direct amends should be avoided. Translation. Is it, when it, comes to, when it comes to where a relationship is maritally, are you gonna harm your spouse by telling them something that they're, they're just, it can't possibly help them? Is it necessary for you to share that directly with them because it'll unburden you? And you're gonna wanna, you know, like, the, the answer, the way it might look right, you're, you're answering it right, the way it might look is absolutely yes. In fact, that's what this step is talking about. Are you following that? Like that is a provision of this step that is teaching us how to learn how to become selfless and, and how to learn how to become compassionate and how to learn how to put myself into the, into the shoes and into the heart of somebody else which is something that outside of recovery, we've probably been away from for a while because our compulsion takes every part of us up into itself. Well, what do you do in that case where sharing information with somebody is going to harm them? Well, first of all, before you assume, before you assume the, the harm capacity of that, that would be a case where you sit down with your sponsor, right, over a period of time, you don't be in a rush to make this decision and you talk this through. 
You don't assume that, in other words, one of the things I've learned in my own recovery is I do not assume that what I think to be true by myself, of myself, with no other collaboration coming from anywhere else, it's got to be true. It's like I have learned that it's safe and healthy and reasonable in order for me to ask questions, right, of my own perspective. And to do that with other people that I trust and love, which is the purpose of the fellowship of recovery, amen? That's what good recovery does. That's what going to meetings does. That's what coming here does. We trust each other enough to say, I'm actually gonna sit down with you, right? And I'm gonna question the veracity, the credibility of what I'm saying and what I'm thinking and how I'm feeling. And I'm gonna allow you to step into my life and do that with me. I'm gonna allow Jesus to step into my life over a period of time and do that examination work of several different things with me. So assuming that you've talked to a therapist or you've talked to your sponsor and there's agreement that in fact, sharing this information with this person in your life who you wanna make amends to isn't, is gonna be injurious, it's gonna be, it's gonna be damaging to them or there's at least a potential for that, what do you do? What are some indirect, what are some alternatives to direct making direct amends? Number one, it is always possible for you to completely change your actions going forward, right, with that person and with other persons. So you can change your actions. Number two, you can choose to start to give back and give of yourself to some kind of a ministry, some kind of a project, some kind of a need that, ha- that is gonna cause you to learn to give out, to give of yourself, service work. Number three, you can write a letter to the person that you wanna share an amends with and you can not mail the letter. But you can share that letter with a sponsor, therapist, somebody with some significant time in the program. You can, and I, I, I know that this is helpful because I've been involved in this, you can use a sponsor or a therapist as sort of a, as sort of a proxy for this experience, right? You can, ask, you can ask your sponsor or ask your therapist or ask somebody in the program, would you be willing Tuesday afternoon to sit down with me and let me share an amends with you that is in fact for this person in my life. And so what you would do is you will simply share with the sponsor, the therapist, or or whoever, you will share your feelings with them as if you're talking to the person that you have hurt. Another piece of this step is, before I do anything with this, I gotta examine two things. Number one, I gotta examine the status of my identity with Jesus. Can I say before I start this step, regardless of what she says to me, regardless of what he says to me, regardless of the outcome of this experience, if I'm gonna have one that's face-to-face, or if I'm gonna have one indirectly, it doesn't matter. Regardless of the outcome, do I know that I am loved by Jesus? Do I know that this this experience isn't gonna change the way that Jesus loves me? Do I know that I belong to him? Do I know that I'm safe with him? And do I know that I'm valued by him? And do I know that my value in Jesus isn't gonna be diminished as a result of the outcome of this experience. While I'm doing that, I also gotta ask myself this question, what is my motive? Is my motive principally that regardless of the way this other person feels, it's gonna make me feel better to unburden myself? Because if that that is the sum total of how we look at this step, well then I'm still very much living in my in my self-centeredness, am I not? I'm still principally talking about, well, I mean, this is right, this is good for me, and so if it's good for me, 
it ought to be good for somebody else because they're exactly like me, also not true. <laughs> and so I'm just gonna go on with it because I'm comfortable with it. It's like I gotta examine my motives, which is why you go back to that, those criterion of what, what equals, what in this equals harm? What equals harm? So there's, there's a story, um, there's a story in the Bible of Jesus working this step with this guy named Peter. Maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't, but um, in, the, in the Bible, in the second half of the Bible, there's a book that I really, really like a lot um, called the, the Gospel of John. So in the order of the second half of the Bible, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then you have John. I'm gonna recommend everybody in the world and everybody who will listen to me, if you're not gonna read any other part of the Bible at all ever, would you please just read, would you please read John? Would you just read John and take notes on John and read it slowly and get everything you can out of it? Because if you read John, the truth is you're gonna wanna read a lot more of the Bible, you will. But if you'll read John, you're gonna grasp the heart of Jesus. You're gonna grasp the nature of Jesus. You're gonna grasp the character of Jesus. Just in the first six chapters, really, you're gonna get that. And so this, this story is in the very last part of that book. I think it's, I believe it's John 21. So Jesus is sitting there having a meal with the guys that had followed him for three years. And he says to Peter, who is sitting there, it's like a, it's like a, a very unique um, perspective, I think, on this step because Peter is sitting there carrying a truckload of guilt. And the guilt that he's carrying is because he ended up being the guy, he ended up being the guy who at the toughest moment where someone says to him before Jesus is about to die, do you know Jesus? Do you know him? Do you know who this guy is? Do you stand for him? Are you his friend? Are you his follower? And Peter goes, I, I, I don't even know him. I never heard of him. Never seen him. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like he said it once, like for good measure, he, he says it three times. And so now we have Jesus in this story and here's he and Peter are sitting there and uh, Jesus goes, Peter, do you, do, you, do you love me? And he says, you know, I, you know I love you. And he tells Peter, well, this, this is what that, he basically is telling Peter, love equals action. Like if you read this story, you're gonna see like, love equals action. So he gives Peter, I don't wanna wreck the whole story for you, but he gives Peter three different action steps. Feed my lambs, feed my lambs. And then the third one he says to him is, you know, since you love me, I need you to know that the cost of you loving me is you're gonna end up going places, which is true in his life, where you don't wanna go. You're gonna have, you're gonna have difficult experiences and you're gonna, you're, gonna die, you're gonna die in a martyr kind of way. You're gonna die in a difficult way. And what Jesus is doing is he is restoring Peter's heart because what he's doing is he's doing a ninth step with Peter and he's, he's allowing Peter to experience the freedom from the burden, from the guilt, from the shame that he's been carrying around about rejecting Jesus. And like my question is, do you not see how this step is an unbelievably holy, sacred resurrection experience? And do you not see that it really isn't about an outcome? It's like, you may do this step assuming that this person isn't gonna be harmed. You may, you may, fully, you may fully engage in this step. You may be honest with this person. You may share with you, them what happened to you, where you were wrong. You may ask them, you may ask them to forgive you for the, for the way that you hurt them. 
And one of the possibilities that's going to exist, which is why you got to be ready and you got to have backup and you got to have reasonable support from the program, one of the possibilities could be that the person's basically going to go, thanks, but no thanks. One of the possibilities is they're going to be indignant about the fact that you're talking to them about this. One of the possibilities is going to be they're going to be they're going to start off angry when you're when you're talking to them, and they're going to end up angry at the end. All those are possibilities. I've seen all those happen. Like every one of these stories doesn't end where you share your amends. And I mean, making amends means your willingness to take responsibility for what happened with you and what you did to cause you know to cause that person to hurt. Right. Making amends doesn't mean that it's gonna necessarily be reciprocated in a nice, clean way by the other person. Do you follow that? That isn't really, that isn't really the object, the outcome isn't really the objective of this step. The process is. The willingness is. The opportunity for you to have a clear heart is. The opportunity for you not to be bound by, not to be bound by your feelings about yourself relative to what happened with you and this person. And that's where Jesus says, love equals action. And action means I am willing to take this step and I am willing to do this work, but I do not know how I will, what the outcome will be. And I I cannot, I cannot, I cannot possibly predict it. Do you think it's true? Do you guys think it's true that God is a, um, do you think it's true that God is a, is a choreographer? Do you think God choreographs stuff in your life? Yes or no? Like, <laughs> if you spend very much time with God, whether you like it or not, he is the ace king at this, right? Like he, so I, I, this is an experience I have the other day. So I go and, and somebody here asks me if I would be willing to go the Friday before, the Friday before Thanksgiving, if I'd be willing to go to, um, to Jewelry TV and do a five minute sort of a daily little talk on something, you know, gratitude or something, for a prayer service that they're gonna have, that they have every year, normally have this full auditorium of people. This year, of course, almost nobody. Would I be willing to do that? There are gonna be five other pastors. And, um, you know, would I be willing to go there and do that? And (laughs) every possible way that I could have liked to have said no to that is on the radar right now, amen? Like. If I were to tell you that Mark Beebe was just absolutely thrilled and delighted with the idea of getting up Friday morning and putting on a sport coat and all this and going over to Jewelry TV to talk for five minutes, let alone listen to five other pastors, some of who (laughs) I already knew were gonna be boring as all get out, just to be honest. Like, did I really wanna do that? It's like. Absolutely, in every way, positively, no. But I, I like go there. My attitude was like less than stellar, let's just say. Let's just say. That's putting it mildly. So I go to Jewelry TV, and like I'm a little bit fascinated with the Jewelry TV thing. because like they have all these like really slick, cool um, conveyor systems and all this stuff for how they how they automate all of their shipping and all that. Thing. Like, I thought that was pretty cool stuff. I'm still going, well, maybe that's the one thing I got out of is I got to see some of their cool toys. Like, I, you know, and I really did like all the people. I liked all the people that I met there, the CEO, really cool guy, the whole leadership team, intense believers, right, in all the right ways. So I'm thinking, you know, this, at least I got to meet some cool people. My attitude is getting somewhat minimally better. Right, but I'm still, I'm still like, not liking the whole deal of you know, the, this little dealy and this little dealy. So like, I'm number three out of five or whatever, you know. So I get up and do my daily, and everybody thanks everybody, and we go home. Except we don't go home right away. Like I'm, I'm walking down the hallway, and I'm, I'm talking to this one pastor that I know, and I'm like, 
you know, so how you doing? And he goes, he looks right at me and he goes, well, not really all that great. And he starts telling me a story about what has happened in his life in the last five months. And the story that he tells me, I mean, it's, it's um, hellish. Just was. It wasn't, I was prepared to go, how you doing? He's supposed, you know how it goes. He's supposed to go fine. And then we're supposed to go on, right? That's how we do it. Except that isn't how we did it. And about, about an hour and a half later, we're still in the parking lot of Jewelry TV. I thought it was about 10 minutes. And, and all this stuff is happening in this conversation. And I get in my car and I go, <laughs> you are such an idiot because like, do you realize now that the re- you, your stupid plan that you were all put out that you're gonna go do a five minute deal at Joy TV on gratitude and all that, none of that had anything to do with this morning. The only reason God brought your stupid self over there is to have that talk with that pastor right then and whether I liked it or not, God was choreographing all of that. Every bit of that. And like, I don't know in your life, when you get ready to do this step, when you become willing, which is the eighth step, when you become completely willing to be able to immerse yourself in telling the truth and being honest and being compassionate and and learning how to just be completely open with somebody else, when you become completely willing, I firmly believe that God will choreograph the right opportunity for you to do that. Most likely when you least expect it. And what I would tell you is when it comes to this step, don't worry so much about making an, making an appointment and having the right time that you think is the right time um, to, to work with somebody, you know, to, to do this step with somebody. You know what we should be doing? What we should be doing is making an appointment with God. We should be saying to God, I am now willing and able to do this with this person whenever you choreograph how you want me to do it. And trust me, when you're not choreographing your own life, you're gonna know, (laughs) you're gonna know when God is dancing and taking the lead. You're gonna know. You might not like it, but you're gonna know. Do I think that God choreographs this step? I I really do. One of the questions that comes out of this that you gotta answer is, before you ever go into this step, what are your hopes and expectations? If you're saying, well, my hope is that we're gonna have a reconciliation, that that wouldn't be, I mean, that wouldn't be a necessarily fruitful hope. That's an expectation even tougher. What is my hope? My hope is that God is gonna give me the courage, the strength, and and the willingness to be able to share the truth. Share the truth. Share what happened. Share what my part of this is. What is my expectation? My expectation is is that, you know, God is gonna get the glory for this step. And my expectation is that he's gonna work to set me free from myself in yet another way as yet another part of my recovery. This step in every way is a transformation step. And here's what I've seen happen to people when they work this step, is you you do it for the first time. It's usually hell. I mean, it's usually just very difficult. It may, the outcome may not be what you thought it would be, all of that, but you do it. The next experience in your life where you're in a relationship and something goes sideways, you're gonna find yourself more willing and more available to to be able to sit down with somebody and go, I really, I really want you to know that I blew that. And I I wanna tell you right now, and I don't want it to go any farther, and I want you to let you know what my part of that was. It's like my, my parents, one time I made, I made them, a, sometimes when you ask your parents questions, they tell you stuff you don't want to know. 
Have you ever had that happen? And so one time I'm asking, my dad is making, is making, he made breakfast for us every Saturday morning before he went to work. So he's making breakfast, he's making French toast or whatever, and those little sausage things, I like those anyway. He's making this. And so I asked this question, I was probably, I bet I was, I was probably 14 years old. So I go, Dad, how do you and Mom, how do you and Mom, how do you ever, how do you ever stay together all this time with all of us and all the stuff that goes on in our house? Like, how do you do it? Because, I mean, my parents weren't exactly like, you know, when I, did, when I used to do premarital counseling with people, I'd be like, tell me about how your parents experienced, um, how did they experience conflict? So like people are gonna, sometimes people go, well, you know what, my parents, I mean like, my parents never fought. I'm like, I wanted to go, either that is not true or you probably shouldn't be married right now because man, this is, really gonna get, this is really gonna get difficult. If your more is, there's no conflict in relationships, this is, really, this is really gonna get difficult. You know, I would run probably, but anyway, my dad goes, well, here's how we did it. Now, he, he, had my, he had my 10-year-old sister and me sitting there around this kitchen table. He goes, the way we did it is, like at the end of the day, no matter what was going on between us, when we went to bed, we would stand there if, if, there, if we were in the middle of something together, and we would take all of our clothes off and stand there and talk to each other about what was wrong. Now like, when your parents tell you something like that, and you're 14, if you think that it's awkward to see them kiss, this is like a whole nother level, amen? But you know what? Like, that right there is some unbelievably healthy stuff to think about, isn't it? Because like what you're basically saying is we're gonna become completely um, vulnerable to each other and we're gonna, we're gonna accept the necessity of vulnerability in order to respect the intensity and the gift of this relationship. That's what we're gonna do. And I mean, that has stuck with me. Well, first of all, the fact that he said it has stuck with me, but that has stuck with me my whole life. Like, I just think that is an impression you're not gonna get out of yourself anytime soon. But it's important. It's important. It's like, it takes me back to the piece of scripture in Genesis. They were naked and not ashamed. They were completely vulnerable and not ashamed. If you're offering a gift at the altar, and they remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift. Go and be reconciled to your brother or sister, then come back and offer your gift. Because see, like, the gift you gotta give first is the gift of vulnerability, the gift of willingness, the gift of availability, and the gift of honesty. And no, no other gift, in the end, no other gift matters until that one goes first. And, and that's, that's what this step is saying. We're gonna close with um, a song and some time to pray up front here. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna be, um, I'm gonna be making um, white chips available. And a white chip is a chip that you pick up when you've decided that for whatever reason, you're sick and tired of living the way you've been living and you wanna begin the work of living a transformed free life. So we'll be up here with those chips and um, now's a great time to pray. Thank you so much. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.